David, your collection of things that you use in your work is incredible. Why are you collect Southern black memorabilia? Now, why is that? Well, actually, this the blackface series, um, as well as pretty much all the work that I've done uh, since I started working with toys, which was in 1972. Uh, the series have always and often evolved um, by happenstance. Um, the Blackface series really began uh, when I was trying to put together figures for a, a kind of recreation of Birth of a Nation, the D.W. Griffith film. And in doing my sort of collecting for that, I came across the black memorabilia, which I'd always had a, a certain passing familiarity with, you know, the Aunt Jemima cookie jars and the salt and pepper shakers. But uh, I happened to be at a very large uh, antique show in Atlantic City, and it was the first time that I really began to see the depth and the sort of breadth of material and the first time I took some of the objects into the Polaroid studio, which is where I do most of my work on the 20 by 24 Polaroid camera, the images were so powerful that I decided that, you know, the idea of redoing the birth of a nation really lost uh, its interest to me. And I really focused on the black memorabilia and I started doing more research. I think quite frankly, coming from a liberal arts background. Uh, I went to Stanford as an undergraduate. You know, my first inclination whenever I'm beginning a series is to find some books and do some reading. And, um, you know, I found some wonderful material on black memorabilia and I just became fascinated, as I said, by how much material there was, um, the just historical range. I mean, I have some objects from, you know, the late 1800s, and I have some figures from 1990. So it, to me, it became a sort of reference uh, for American social history. And a lot of the objects are European uh, because of their long colonial past. A lot of objects are Japanese. Um, so there's a real sort of cultural uh, history in the objects, uh, not just of America, but of you know, Europe and the Far East as well. Um, and my collections really s sort of come from the work. I'm not, you know, although my sister once said that I'm really a, um, a toy collector and art is my hobby. Um, all the, the, the figures that I've collected from the various series are really in reference to work that I'm doing. But I may very well collect figures for a considerable amount of time before I actually begin the work. With the Blackface series, um, I was really beginning the work and beginning collecting pretty much simultaneously. and I ended up going to a couple of uh, shows in the Washington DC area of specifically of black memorabilia, which were quite interesting in and of themselves because most of the dealers, I would say 75%, as well as uh, an equal number of the visitors to the show were African American. When you make these photographs, what is it that you are saying about these collections, about this part of the, the cultural history of the United States? I think it really, you know, it varies. Um, one of my earliest series with uh, the 20 by 24 Polaroid camera was of uh, cowboy and Indian figures. And for me, it was really a way to go back and re-examine my childhood. You know, I grew up in the 50s. Um, at a time when I sort of call it the first television generation. And um, 
many, if not most, of the programs on television were Westerns. Uh, I think I read in one of the, the books when I was doing some research that you know, 60% of the television programs were, were Westerns during a period in the 50s. Um, if you looked at an old Sears toy catalog, there were page after page of uh, toy cap guns uh, and Western outfits for kids. So there was um, a lot for me personally of sort of re-examining that and the way it created this sort of faux history. You know, it was about a West, uh, as I said once in a lecture, a West that never existed, but always will be. And, um, you know, when you look at those programs, uh, you know, when you have some distance on them, they were very sort of socializing and moralistic. You know, the, the bad guys always were brought to justice somehow, and you were kind of inculcated with the idea of sacrificing your individuality for the good of the town or the wagon train or and that sort of ideology was one that was really promoted by those early programs you know that um, sort of John Wayne uh, heroic attitude and the attitude of sacrifice um, which had nothing to do with the reality of either the history of the American West or uh, of combat. So I think what I was trying to do with the Western work was to look back on it with a certain sense of nostalgia but also a certain critique. And what was interesting to me about that work is um, when I was able to do a traveling show which originated at the Gene Autry Museum back in the, I guess it was in the mid-90s, uh, the response at an institution like the Autry was very different than, say, the response to showing that work in New York. And I've always said about my work that it's um, intentionally ambiguous, you know, that it's meant to draw the viewer in and really reflect upon the viewer's own feelings and sort of remembered imagery so that somebody might look at it as very nostalgic but somebody else might look at it as a critique of you know the American West as portrayed by John Ford and Frederick Remington um, and yet it's the same piece of artwork it's almost as if the artwork serves as a kind of Rorschach test more for the viewer uh, than for myself. David, what about the response abroad? Because the work, this body of work, both the, the, the blackface and also the, the cowboy and Indian, is so typically American. Mm -hmm. How were they received abroad? Um, I think the cowboy work has always been very well received. Um, the blackface work uh, is work that I've always felt, uh, if I had the opportunity to sort of show it on a larger scale rather than just a few images, uh, would be, you know, showing it in Europe would be very intriguing to me because of the history of colonial Africa that is so strong in countries like Belgium, and France, uh, England. Um, and I hope that someday, you know, I'll have that opportunity to put together uh, a larger exhibition of the work rather than just a handful of images. At present, the blackface work has been shown primarily in this country. And um, I'd have to say one of the best receptions for the work that I ever had was um, in Alexandria, Virginia at uh, a local black history museum and the museum is in what I believe is the first black public library in the United States uh, and the audience there was terrific I mean it was a 
a very sort of wide range of people from the African American community primarily. And both the younger people and the older people were extremely receptive to the work and very, very positive about it. I, I was curious to see the, the uh, connection between the white dolls mm -hmm. that were also sexually depicted along with the, the black memorabilia, mm -hmm. the, the women depicted. Well, there's always, you know, an exaggeration of the female form. Um, and I think that sort of is true in so many aspects of our culture and our society that, um, you know, the the Triple X series, uh, which is the series that I did with these plastic model kits of what are essentially exotic dancers. Um, and even uh, an earlier series called American Beauties, which was these small plastic figures from the 50s that had that sort of post-war um, sensuality and sexuality, the kind of Marilyn Monroe, Betty Grable figures, um, you know, really captured that period's uh, imagery of sexuality for women. Um, and, you know, there's, there's always been that kind of exaggeration um, in figures uh, dealing with women, I think, regardless of um, sort of the style or the period of the piece. David, which came first? Your photography or your collecting? Well, um, I think it was really the photography. Um, you know, I started doing, uh, working with toys when I was in graduate school and I started working with these very small, uh, what are called HO scale toy soldiers, just little plastic figures, you know, 50 to a box. Um, one thing that was actually quite fascinating to me is uh, several years ago when my uh, grandmother passed away, we were going through all the things in her apartment here in New York, and my sister came across these photographs of me from uh, Christmas in 1954. So I was about four and a half years old. And I had gotten a set of these beautifully hand-painted, German-made cowboy and Indian figures. And as my sister pointed out, I was looking quite serious. But uh, these were figures that I ended up photographing, you know, 30 years later. Um, not all of the ones that I originally had survived because uh, in addition to my sister, I had two younger brothers. So there was, um, most of the toys were, were damaged, but um, I did manage to save a few and I was able to, to find some of these earlier toys. And uh, then the company started making them in uh, plastic. Uh, they had been made in something called uh, composition, which was like a, a sort of a paste made of uh, wood pulp products with a wire armature and then hand painted. I mean, they're quite beautiful and very um, stylized in the sense of, say, 40s Hollywood, you know, with the rounded hats and the polka dot scarves for the cowboys. Um, and that's what, those were the figures that I used for the Wild West series. So. Uh, there was some collecting involved that I'm sure, you know, as a child, because I did uh, buy little metal toy soldiers um, and play with them often on my floor, that I think all of that, you know, kind of came to the surface when I started using toys, uh, particularly toy soldiers, as my subject matter. When did the tableau idea come? Um, the tableau uh, ideas really came in graduate school. I mean, I went to graduate school uh, having sort of worked through my Ansel Adams and Edward Weston period, and I was doing more sort of a, a Lee Friedlander type of, you know, social documentary photography. Um, the tableaus really started my second year in graduate school when I wanted to do some work in a studio environment 
and just again totally by chance was walking through a department store in New Haven um, in the toy department and I saw these play sets and it reminded me a little bit of you know my childhood and I thought well I'll take one of these play sets uh, set it up in the studio and um, you know use this work for my uh, thesis project and it was really an outgrowth of that that led me to the toy soldiers and it was the toy soldiers that uh, really generated the momentum. I went home over the Christmas break and just shot hundreds and hundreds of photographs uh, on the floor of my old bedroom and became extremely enthusiastic because you know this was something really new and different and um, when I came back in January for portfolio review um, you know I was going to Yale and Walker Evans was teaching there at the time and so most of the work people were doing was a very sort of refined and careful presentation you know large format photography uh, over matted prints uh, you know very elegant presentation uh, my presentation consisted of about 400 codolith prints and putting them in front of various people and saying, you know, I'm really excited about this new work. And fortuitously, uh, Linda Connor was the visiting artist for a week uh, in from the San Francisco Art Institute. And Linda really shared and encouraged my enthusiasm. And that was sort of the um, momentum that I needed to really, you know, continue pursuing that for the rest of the year. And um, you know, it, it, there was just a lot of sort of youthful enthusiasm. Um, and then shortly after graduation, um, one of my classmates, Gary Trudeau, um, was approached by his publisher who said, you know, why don't you and David combine your work to do a book project? And that was really the the genesis of the Hitler Musees book, which came out in 1977. Gary was a um, graphic design graduate student at Yale. Uh, we were in the same program because photography was sort of a sub-department of design. And um, for his thesis project, he did a visual biography of um, a German Luftwaffe pilot using just graphic symbols. He essentially created a character and this whole sort of history uh, using graphics. And I was doing the toy soldiers and many of the toy soldiers, if not most of the ones I was photographing, um, were little German, you know, World War II figures. And I had read a book by a German author um, called Hitler Moves East. That was the translation from the German. Uh, the author's name was Paul Carell. And it was a very similar to Cornelius Ryan's book, The Longest Day, which is essentially weaving together first person accounts in a sort of dramatic fashion. So the book really almost reads like a novel. And um, when Gary's publisher, uh, Jim Andrews, uh, saw Gary's work and some of my photographs, because you know, we had traded some work as graduate students are, you know, want to do, um, he was the one who said, you, know, you two guys should do a book together. And um, you know, this was back in, I guess, either late 73 or early 74. And you know, we were both like 24 years old and we thought well that sounds like a cool idea you know and I, I think when we signed I remember when we got our advance checks which were all of about $750 a piece you know Gary handed me my check and he said now remember if you cash this check we really do have to make this book um, and we actually you know we thought we'd be finished in a year it took us about three and a half years um, but it really allowed Gary to, you know, use 
both his design skills and his editorial skills because I was doing the photographs and he was really sort of working them together into this kind of coherent structure. Um, and my work evolved a lot over the three and a half years. You know, I started out initially doing these very sort of raw tableaus just on a floor and then I kept adding more and more sort of background material. And actually most of the images in the book were probably shot during about a nine month period. But it took me over two years to sort of develop the work stylistically. And once that happened, the work came very, very quickly. Um, so, you know, it was a real sort of evolutionary process for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was a great collaboration and, you know, Gary and I are, you know, still friends to this day. So it's been now, you know, over 30 years. <laughs> How influenced were you by film? Um, well, I'm glad you asked that question. I would say film more than any other art form uh, has been the most pervasive influence on my work. The, uh, the Modern Romance series, which drew very heavily upon sort of Edward Hopper paintings, uh, drew equally from uh, film noir. And in fact, I, I sort of was introduced to film noir at an exhibition at the San Francisco uh, Museum where they ran a film series uh, based on films whose imagery was drawn from Hopper's paintings. It was part of a large Hopper retrospective, I think back in the early 80s. Uh, but film's always been sort of a source that I've turned to, whether it was for you know, the toy soldiers looking at both documentary and fictional war films. Um, it's, you know, it's something that I've always gravitated to, I, as I said, more than I think any other art form as a kind of a reference. David, thank you very much for letting us come. Oh, well, thank um, you. It was a joy. <laughs> thank you. And a delight. Thank, thank you. you, David.